Okay, so welcome to the second lecture. Um, so just at the start, I'd like to make a note. Sometimes I make errors in class, um, and some of these I never catch in class. Some of them I catch in class, and uh, I correct in class, and some of them I catch afterwards. And for those types of errors, I will prepare some sort of a correction and share them with you afterwards, okay? Um, through Moodle, for instance. Okay, so I'd like to finish up the mathematical review part today. Uh, essentially, last time we talked about some differential operations like gradient and curl um, on the Cartesian coordinate system. So let's make a note of how things roughly look in non-Cartesian coordinates, and there are two popular choices. The first one is the cylindrical or polar coordinate system. So um, the notation I will use is as follows. So let's first draw the Cartesian coordinate system. I have x1 and x2, and these are essentially defined by their corresponding basis vectors, in this case, E1 and E2. And through the right-hand rule, the out-of-plane direction would be X3, and that's accompanied by the uh, basis vector E3. Uh, so I'll pick some point, let's say here, and draw its position vector. I'm assuming uh, not necessarily that the vector lies in um, the x1, x2 plane, but I'm looking from the top. So it's like this is the projection I see of the vector onto the x1, x2 plane. So that's the position vector x, and it has in-plane components um, x1 um, and x2. So the magnitude of the vector, let's say it's, um, or the in-plane, this, the length of this projection of the vector into the x1, x2 uh, plane, it's r. This angle is uh, theta. And now with respect to the direction of this um, vector, I will define a unit vector er. That would be the radial direction. And then I will define yet another one, which, which would be e theta. That would be the tangential direction. So that's radial and that's tangential, or sometimes I will say simply angular. Um, so um, if I look at the Cartesian system, uh, the common thing to say is that I have coordinates x1, x2, x3. If I talk about the cylindrical coordinate system, the coming, coming um, coordinates to use would be r, so the distance, theta, the angle, and instead of x3, it's more common to indicate the direction simply with z, okay? So z will be the so-called axial direction, and the basis vector with ez. That's just um, a more conventional um, choice. So x1 is, of course, r cosine theta, and x2 is r sine theta. So using that relation between the coordinates, eventually what one will try to do, the aim would be to, let's say, express the gradient with respect to not to the Cartesian coordinate system, but with respect to the polar coordinate system. We're not going to do that in detail. I'm just going to make, up, make a note of a few major results. But let me highlight at this point that both for the cylindrical or polar coordinate system as well as the next one, which is going to be the spherical one, what's important is that these basis vectors depend on the point you're looking at, right? So for instance, this is the radial direction if I'm looking at that point. If I change the angle, I will be looking at another point, the radial direction changes. The tangential direction also changes. So for these types of coordinate systems, the basis vectors are not fixed. They depend on the position you're looking at, which was not the case for the Cartesian coordinate system. Those basis vectors, they are always fixed. We can see this explicitly by making a relation in this case between ER, for instance, and um, E1 and E2, and likewise between E theta and E1 and E2. Okay. So depending on the choice of the angle, the basis vectors 
change their direction. So they are not constants, which is important to keep in mind when you're calculating gradients and derivatives. So um, now the position vector, like we talked last time, it's a vector. So its representation may depend on the choice of the coordinate system, but it is, in the end, a physical entity. So it could be expressed with respect to the Cartesian coordinate system or with respect to the polar coordinate system. So with respect to the polar coordinate system, R, E, R would be its position um, as observed when I look from the top on that picture. But then, of course, there is a alpha plane component. And that we will indicate with, in this case, Z, E, Z. Okay. Um, so I could take an arbitrary vector. This is just the position vector. For an arbitrary vector, um, it will, in general, have all three components non-zero. So if you look with respect to the cylindrical basis, the ER component is non-zero. E theta component is not there. It's zero by description. EZ component is C. So in general, for an arbitrary vector, there will be a radial component. There will be an angular component or a tangential one. And there will be a axial component. Okay. Now, similarly, we could take an arbitrary matrix and represent that in the cylindrical coordinate system. And uh, to indicate the basis, one way to think about is you create a grid of the components of vectors, so r theta z, r theta z. And then, so that's like your 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, right? So you go here, it's a 1, 1. So it's a r r, 1, 2, a r theta, and so on. a r z, a theta r a theta theta, a theta z, a z r, a z theta, and a z z. So this is how I would express the components of a matrix in the cylindrical coordinate system. OK, so now um, this is not the purpose of this course, but we will eventually need the expression of, let's say, a gradient or a divergence in the cylindrical coordinate system. So we're not going to drive them. And it's just simply writing down equations that you can easily find uh, in online references, notably our online reference. You can easily find it. You can find these also in your math books. Um, so, But let me just make a note that operations look different in the polar coordinate system with respect to the um, Cartesian one. So for instance, let's take a function. This function could be a function of position. And in the polar coordinate system, I would indicate that as such. So f depends on r, theta, and z. And now suppose I would like to calculate the components of the gradient of the function. So the way that looks in the polar coordinate system is, so del f del r. The second one, it's not only del f del theta, but rather it's 1 over r del f del theta. And the last one is del f del z. So in the Cartesian one, this would be del f del x1, <coughs> del f del x2, del f del x3. But in the polar one, the left del theta has a 1 over r factor in front of it. So similarly, divergence, et cetera, operations also look slightly different uh, due to our choice of the coordinate system. So uh, you should see our online reference for further details. Uh, when we need, for instance, divergence of a matrix in a cylindrical coordinate system, I will write the result directly. And then by comparing with online references, you can see uh, the reason for our results. Okay, so I will skip the um, 
let's say, the mess of having to write everything in detail, at least in this part. OK, so similarly, let's talk about the spherical coordinate system. That's the second particular choice that we will be dealing with. So let me first draw the Cartesian coordinate system. Um, and now I will pick a point, let's say that, draw its position vector, x. Okay. So, um, this would be its x1 component, the x2 component and x3 component. Now, um, I will define three vectors. Right? So the first one is the vector that is along the vector itself. The vector itself is x. So this here, it's one vector. Let's draw it with a different color. So that's ER and that's our radial direction. So now there are two angular directions. There are different names for it, uh, for spherical coordinate systems. I'm not going to explicitly refer to them. But so if this is the radial direction, uh, there are two more directions. One of these directions is associated with this angle. And let's call that angle theta. Okay. So if the angle theta is 0, this vector aligns with the E3 axis. So if I increase theta, it will approach from the E3 axis towards this line, for instance. If I only change theta, it will rotate down to this line. Okay? So the direction of that rotation instantaneously is a vector that is perpendicular to this uh, position vector, and it points um, in the direction of motion that is associated with the variation of theta. So I will draw it like this. It's hard to see, but so it points towards the direction this point is moving when theta is changing. So let's call that E theta. Um, and I will define a second angle, phi. Okay. So if I change the angle phi when I keep theta and the length of the vector fixed, let's call the length capital R. If I keep these two fixed and only change phi, this point will rotate about the x3 axis. It will follow sort of a circle, right? And the direction it tends to move in when I change phi, it's a vector, again, a unit vector. Let's call it E phi. So that's the direction that this point is going to move when I change phi only. So all of these vectors are perpendicular to each other. So that's perpendicular to that, that's perpendicular to that, and E phi is perpendicular to E theta. So I have only one radial direction and two angular directions um, in this case. OK, so again, you can do the math. And you can, uh, for instance, say that, well, x1 is related to, for instance, uh, the radial um, um, value, the r, um, times, let's say, sine theta times cosine phi. And x2 would be, again, r sine theta. That would be this length. And then sine phi. And x3 would be r simply cosine theta. Okay. And similarly, you can express the basis vectors as well, e r, e theta, e phi, in terms of theta and phi. Uh, I'm not going to do that, but let's write a number of vectors in this coordinate system. So for instance, the position vector, it is very simple. Sorry, I make a correction. The radial vector. Basis vector, let's denote it with a capital R to distinguish it from the cylindrical coordinate system. So x is simply R, E, R. That's the direction. That is the magnitude. That's simple. So similarly, you can take an arbitrary vector. 
let's say, V. And it will have three components. It will have a radial component and two angular components, V theta, V phi. So that's the order we like to write things in, R, theta, and then phi. And I can obtain the representation also for a arbitrary matrix, let's say A. Again, you can think of the values R, theta, and phi as enumerating the components along rows and columns. So this would be ARR. A R theta, A R phi, A theta R, A theta theta, A theta phi, A phi R, A phi theta, and A phi phi would be the representation. Okay. And finally, again, if you want to calculate differential operations on, let's say, a function, of position, so in this case we would express that position dependence using the spherical coordinates. So f depends on r, theta, and phi. And so, for instance, if you would like to calculate the gradient of f, um, it looks as follows. So we have del f over del r, one over r, del f, del theta, and 1 over I R sine theta del F del phi. Okay. Um, and just like we did in the Cartesian coordinate system, sometimes I will use a shorthand notation. Same thing goes for the cylindrical coordinate system. So I might write this as F comma capital R, and this one as, let's say, R inverse F comma theta and that one as r sine theta inverse f comma phi, okay? The comma r, let's say, indicating that I'm taking a derivative with respect to r. Okay. So that's so much for the math review. It's as compact as it gets. And now what I would like to do is after having reminded you of the um, most important mathematical parts, in fact, I've also introduced some, uh, a few small things here and there, just like the curl of a matrix, right? And I told you roughly what a tensor is and why the components of the matrices we'll be dealing with. They depend on the choice of the coordinate system. So those are important concepts that perhaps you have overlooked or you have not seen before. So I'm still sorry about my voice, by the way. I'm still a little bit sick. Uh, but anyway, so now we've covered those, the most important things, okay? Um, and now I'd like to move on slowly, and our aim is to eventually solve problems, right? So I'll go step by step. So we've done the gradients, and eventually, and curls, and et cetera. So now using those, the first thing we will be able to do is, and also having some, um, uh, having recalled the coordinate system, we'll start to talk about displacements and strain. And along with that, I will also introduce a new concept called compatibility. So we will talk about essentially deformation. And then after we talk about deformation, after we complete that, we will talk about the related concept, which is stress, okay? And how stress is related to the equilibrium of objects. And after we do that as well, we will move on to solving problems. 